Welcome back to the Bitcoin layer. I'm Nick Batia, and today we bring on Daniel Batten. Daniel is a venture capitalist and someone who is focused specifically on capturing methane emissions for Bitcoin mining, a very specific sector. Daniel, thank you so much for joining us today. Great to see you again, Nick. So Daniel, so yeah, so so go ahead. so Daniel and I met uh, recently in Australia. I got to sit down and listen to Daniel conduct an interview with Peter McCormick, in which he talked about what he's up to in Bitcoin mining. I found it absolutely fascinating. I wanted to bring Daniel on today so that he can explain to us this incredibly powerful concept of capturing methane emissions from landfills and turning it into energy for Bitcoin mining. So Daniel, talk to us about your fund, how you got into this mission of methane capture and how Bitcoin really fits in. I got interested in Bitcoin from the outside in. I wasn't a Bitcoiner, but I was looking to solve a problem. So I was a member of three different climate tech funds. And before that, I worked as a technology entrepreneur as part of three different teams that helped to take companies global. And with these different climate tech funds, I asked myself a question one day, which is how much impact are we having? And it was a dangerous question because the answer was eh, not that much. I came to the conclusion that we were investing in companies that were high risk, that were only going to have an impact after 2030, and they were only mitigating our carbon dioxide emissions. We were doing nothing for methane emissions, which we were being told by numerous people was a more urgent issue. We were doing nothing pre-2030. These companies were going to have an impact after that. And we were investing in companies that were high risk. So I said, what do we do the opposite? What do we invest in existing technologies that we know work today? Technologies that can have an impact before 2030 and technologies which will mitigate methane where currently only two cents in every climate tech dollar was going into. What do we invest in these areas? And then that started me down a path of thinking, well, where is methane and why are people not mitigating it? And the answer is because there was no economic incentive to do so. So we looked at three areas where the big three are for methane emissions globally, and that's agriculture, oil and gas sector, and landfills and waste. Of those, it was very clear that the lowest hanging fruit was in landfills. The most methane that could be mitigated in a way which is profitable, which, which was not being done. So we drilled down a little further and we found that in half the cases it made the best thing to do with it is power generation. You turn that gas into electrons. You turn that landfill gas into power through a generator. Purify it, send it to a generator. And then if you can, send it to the grid. The problem is in half the cases you can't sell it to the grid because that grid can't handle that much power. It needs a major decamillion substation upgrade. So we said, well, that's half the world's landfill gas emissions that's just venting into the air, sometimes flaring into the air. That's a lot of methane. What if there was someone who could use that power on site? And, okay, well, who's going to use that power on site? Well, it has to be a pretty special sort of customer who wants to set up in the middle of nowhere in a smelly landfill. That's not everyone. So they have to be location agnostic. And secondly, it's going to be expensive initially because they have to invest in infrastructure to collect that gas. Generators are not cheap. And so it only makes sense to invest all that capex if you really care about the cost of electricity because electricity is such a substantial portion of your annual operational budget. Okay, so who do we know who doesn't mind where they set up a business and who has electricity as a very high percentage of their operating budget. Well, there's only one customer in the world who fits that profile, and that's Bitcoin mining companies. So I came to the conclusion that Bitcoin mining was the answer to a really pressing methane emission problem. And we started to look into it and realize, hey, this, this makes economic sense. And we asked, why isn't it happening? Bitcoin mining companies want to do it. Landfill owners want to do it. Well, the reason it wasn't happening is that the funding for it wasn't occurring because it was too risky for private equity, traditional private equity, and it didn't. It was not risky enough for venture capital because there was no intellectual property that was novel. So we spent a year and a half finding a financial instrument that would give a, a projected very good return to wholesale invested, investors and a yield generating fund which could free up 
these Bitcoin mining companies and give them the infrastructure financing they needed with the additional capital expenditure so they could source incredibly cheap electricity. So that's what we did. Today's video is sponsored by River. We are extremely proud to be sponsored by River. It is a Bitcoin only exchange, somewhere you can go to get allocated. And we love River for a few reasons, but most importantly, River does not use a custodian that is an external party. It uses its own method of multi-signature cold storage so that you and your funds are not exposed to the world of counterparty risk. Now, River even encourages you to get your coins off of the exchange as soon as possible. And they also have Lightning Network capability so you can get those coins off like that. Make sure you check out river.com slash TBL. Okay, so Daniel, I want to right away play devil's advocate because when I was listening to you talk to Peter McCormick, one of the things that you mentioned is cap and trade and how some of this infrastructure finance is economically based in some of the cap and trade incentive uh, incentive structures. So let's talk about cap and trade right away. Are are any of your projects fully reliant on cap and trade uh, arrangements? And for and maybe you can just explain to the audience what cap and trade means and how that is involved in what you do. Because the the fundamental thing that the reason that we brought you on here today is that capturing methane emissions in order to power Bitcoin miners has an incredibly potential impact on the planet from a pollution standpoint and from an air quality standpoint before we even get into anything uh, to do with climate change or general corporate ESG narratives. So this is this is an enormous thing that we want to focus on here is capturing methane and from landfills specifically like you said, low hanging fruit. So now what is, what is cap and trade and what does it have to do with your businesses? Sure. So there is this mechanism called carbon credits and I see Bitcoin mining with landfill gas and carbon credits. is kind of like a Nick Cave and Kylie Minogue duet. You wouldn't expect it to work, but somehow it just does. And it's one of the few examples of a creation of governments that came from the Paris Climate Accord, which actually has the potential to work and work really well. Now, there are a whole lot of landfills out there that are currently flaring their gas emissions. So that means that they're just burning it. And that flare stack will burn around 91% of the methane. And so if you look at some of the existing Bitcoin mining companies, such as the marathons of this world, Nodal Power and Vespin in the United States, they're taking those flare gas emissions and they're swapping out the flare stack and they're swapping in Bitcoin mining, uh, which is great because that's less infrastructure intensive and it's mitigating the additional 9% of methane. We want to go one step further. We want to take landfills that are currently venting 100% of their methane and we want to target those ones because that, in terms of impact, in terms of emission reduction, that is stupendously higher. And how much higher? Well, it's so much higher that if you took 35 venting landfills and you turn them into Bitcoin mining projects, that would be enough to offset the entire emissions of the Bitcoin network, which would be tremendous in terms of a narrative shift. So whether you think emissions are important or not, I think everyone would agree that there has been a certain environmental narrative that's been used against Bitcoin very effectively for a long time. And the best way to shut that down is actually to to shut it up. Uh, And that is to say, look, actually, we have the first emission negative industry in the entire world. And that's something that can be achieved through this particular sort of Bitcoin mining. But we're not going to get there through targeting fled landfills. We're going to get there through targeting landfills that are currently venting their emissions. And to do that, it makes sense to have the carbon credit component as well, because that makes a whole lot more landfills economically viable that otherwise wouldn't have. So it allows us to scale and go much faster. Part of what we want to talk about is this difference between carbon emissions and methane emissions. And I think one of the problems that 
many people have with a climate political agenda is that targeting the consumption of oil and gas can be directly opposed to human flourishing and just the general well-being of a population trying to restrict the energy consumption of the population but what registers so it, it what registers so closely with me here is that capturing the methane emissions from landfills is not targeting people and their consumption of energy and it's more one trying to change the behavior as to how much trash actually ends up in that landfill, of course. But then once the trash is in the landfill, trying to prevent toxic toxic chemicals getting into the air and actually affecting our general air quality. So I know that that's something that matters to you as well. And can you just speak to the difference in, in your interaction with Bitcoiners and their attitudes toward the consumption of energy, specifically carbon emissions, oil and gas versus methane. Is there is there something that you feel is there when you talk to people in Bitcoin? This is something that I feel really brings everyone together. And it doesn't matter what your philosophical standpoint is, your ideology is, your belief system is. Uh, that's something that everyone can agree is a great idea. Uh, environmentalists think it's a great idea because it's taking pollution out of the atmosphere, right? People who are climate deniers think it's a great idea because you're taking something which is a waste and you're turning it into a fuel source. And people who care about human health care because you're taking methane emissions, which is responsible for millions of premature deaths every year, and you're removing that from the atmosphere. And so everyone can agree. Like I've had conversations from people like, uh, Steve Barber, who you know, is very pro coal, and he's fascinated with this area. We're we're chatting together about seeing whether we can repurpose some of his smaller generators to work on landfill gas because he just loves it as a pure energy op opportunity. A lot of the people who are part of the Telegram group I run for vented methane based uh, Bitcoin mining are also part of the oil and gas group as well because there's such a natural crossover between the skills you learn in the oil and gas industry and the skills you need to capture methane. The only difference is it's not coming out under pressure and it has a lower purity rating. You've got to do some more purification before you can send it to the generator. But fundamentally, the principles are identical where you're taking stranded or wasted energy and you're turning it into a source of power. So this has been something that really, I feel, has united a lot of the Bitcoin community. I haven't found anyone who's against it. Um, Bitcoin miners love the idea of taking a waste product and turning it into fuel. And it means cheap power as well. A lot of these Bitcoin mining companies are getting this power for around one cent per kilowatt hour. And even when you factor in the cost of the generators, it's still going to be sub four cents per kilowatt hour, which is very cheap power. Okay, so methane unites us all. Who would have thought? And here we are uh, uniting around the idea of removing methane emissions from the environment and using it to power Bitcoin mining. So now that we are all on the same page and we can all agree about this very, very exciting a dynamic within Bitcoin, let's take it to the next level now. What are some of the economics that you're seeing, some of the best economics out there in the projects that you're funding or have funded? Where are the landfills that are powering Bitcoin miners today that are active right now? The ones that are active right now are in the States. There's a few in Utah. There's some in Marathon County in Wisconsin. And there's also one in Australia. And we're also looking at the pipeline of new landfills. There's some that are coming online, will be coming online in the next year in Australia. Some other ones in South and Central America as well. Central America and South America actually have a really good profile in terms of landfills. And the reason for that is that because of the way the subsidies work on renewable natural gas in the States, once you get up to a landfill which is mid-sized, in many cases it makes more sense to turn that into a renewable natural gas project rather than a power generation project. And that's because of the government incentives and subsidies actually working against uh, what would make more economic sense, which is power generation. 
In countries in the world where you don't have those subsidies, such as Central and South America, however, it makes way more sense to turn that landfill gas into power projects. And the other thing is that the level of purity required on renewable natural gas projects outside America is much, much higher, which means it requires a lot more energy to reach that necessary level of purity to treat gas as a strategic asset which you can sell. So funnily enough, outside inside the US, it tends to be the smaller and the mid-sized landfills that make more sense to do Bitcoin mining projects. Outside the US, it tends to be, it can be anything. It can be even quite large, like 15 megawatt uh, generation can make sense to do a Bitcoin mining operation on. There's a third category as well that we're very excited about, and this is probably going to be a little bit further down the track. And that's when you don't even have a landfill, you just have an open dump. Uh, and I'll give you an example. So in Haiti right now, there is a landfill there, which is just an open dump. And it has two to 3,000 rubbish pickers who work all day and a lot of the night. And they earn around $3 a day, $3, simply picking trash and seeing if they can resell it. Now, the entire time they're inhaling methane, it gives them chronic headaches, it gives them respiratory illnesses. They live right next to the landfill. Their children are there. The landfill poisons their groundwater, essentially. And the children are exposed to methane from a young age. And so in projects like that, there's an opportunity where you can go in and you can convert that dump into a landfill, step one. And then you can start to do a power generation project on it. And these are the projects that only make sense when you have a partnership at a government level. So this is down the track. But then you can start to say, well, look, let's give these people meaningful work. Let's uh, put them into a recycling facility. Let's give them proper protective clothing and let's give them the protective equipment as well. And by removing that methane, the working conditions improve. You pay them a living wage. And the incredible thing about that is that these projects, because they're doing so much social good for an entire community, they're raising the health and well-being, living standards and dignity of an entire community and bringing children out of poverty. The carbon credits that these projects generate trade at a premium, and that's enough to pay for some of the additional work that's involved. So down the track with Bitcoin mining, it can do incredible social good to entire communities as well. Uh, and we're very excited about that. And we're also talking at nation state level to a, a couple of people where down the track, we can start to engage in some of these more ambitious projects. And this is more in the developing world. Can you tell us the names of the countries in South America, Central America that you were referring to in your previous answer? And if you can, the names of any countries that you're already uh, opening dialogue with uh, for landfill infrastructure. So there's a lot of opportunities right now in Mexico, in Colombia, Costa Rica, Paraguay. And we're also investigating at an earlier stage uh, some of the other countries in South America, including El Salvador. And these are some of the areas where it just makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, Mexico, for example, government policy essentially prevents you from selling power back to the grid. So all of the landfills in Mexico have no option to sell power back to the grid, whether it makes economic sense or not. So there's a raft of landfills uh, that are potential targets for Bitcoin mining right across Mexico. And can you tell us about the, when we get back to the economics here, I want to understand with some of these, you mentioned the carbon credits trading at a premium. Explain to us as if we didn't understand, where are these carbon credits trading and how does that market function? There's two different types of carbon markets. There's the compliance markets and there's the voluntary markets. So with the voluntary markets, these are companies who want to offset their emissions. So maybe Google, for example, they have some emissions and they say, we want to become carbon neutral. And how do they do that? They, they use a financial instrument, which is by buying offsets. And so they will typically in the past, they've bought offsets, which are forest based credits. Now, I don't know, Nick, if you've been following a lot of what's been happening to forest-based credits lately, but they've got a lot of flack because people were claiming that they were mitigating emissions where, in fact, they were not. And so that industry has gone into a bit of a decline. And people have legitimately questioned, well, hang on, are these offsets you're actually buying? Are they worth anything? How do we know they have 
that they're actually trustworthy. So what's happened now is there's been this bifurcation where if you can prove, if you can measure that it's having a direct emission impact, those carbon credits will be worth more than the ones where you cannot so easily prove, where it's more subjective, where it's using a, a less robust methodology. So, for example, on voluntary markets right now, you have people, it's a very opaque market, so you can't look at um, little candlesticks on websites. It's, it's like trading in the 1980s, Nick. It's, um, it's over the counter, it's opaque, you, there's middlemen involved, all, all, all the rest. And the interesting thing about these carbon credits is that they, there's not one standardized price as well. So they're more like NFTs, it's, there's subjectivity. And so some carbon credits are worth more than others. If they come from India or China, they'll be worth less. If they're older, they'll be worth less. If they're more measurable, they'll be worth more. Uh, and so that's where these landfill-based carbon credits, they're starting to trade at a 25, sometimes even a 50% premium because you can prove using telemetry exactly how many emissions are being mitigated per minute. And then through your software, you get a read. So you can prove to people as a direct result of this Bitcoin mining project, we have mitigated uh, this many million tons of CO2 equivalent emissions that would have gone directly into the atmosphere that now have been sent to the generator and that methane has been destroyed. Okay, so now you're speaking our language here when it comes to markets. We're talking about now a voluntary market for carbon credits that is specifically responsive to the qualitative Correct. characteristics of the underlying projects and so what's now coming coming into the market is that these Bitcoin mining methane capture facilities are trading at a premium. Is that what you're, you're describing here? Anything that is measurable will be trading at a premium and Bitcoin mining landfill powered projects are one example of something that is very measurable. So that will also trade at a premium. Absolutely fascinating. Okay, so now I wanna get into my next question is about your the statistics that you're about to publish now we see that you claim that bitcoin is the cleanest energy consumer sector wise on the planet talk to us about that if you look across industry right now say banking industry gold industry steel manufacturing zinc recycling, throw in a whole bunch of other industries in there as well. The cleanest ones are the ones in terms of lowest emissions, the ones who are predominantly using electricity. So if you look at the gold sector, for example, it uses a lot of fossil fuel to do the extraction from the ground, a lot of diesel trucks, etc. The banking sector is quite a lot cleaner compared to gold because it's using predominantly electricity. However, that electricity is using a global grid, and globally, most of that grid is powered by fossil fuels. So the banking sector actually is around 60-something percent, I would say about 63 percent at the moment, powered by fossil fuel. Now, if you compare Bitcoin, Bitcoin is 100 percent electrified. Uh, and this is a really key distinction because a lot of the time people say, oh, Bitcoin mining is dirty because it uses fossil fuel. And EVs are clean because they use electricity. It's like, well, hang on a minute. They both use electricity. So either they're both dirty or they're both clean. Let's get that clear right now. So both of them have no indirect or they're fully electrified, right? So in that sense, there's no direct emissions from either. However, there are indirect emissions because you're using electricity, which in some cases has used fossil fuel and the generation of that electricity. Now you can distinguish how much of each one is powered by fossil fuels. What's unique about Bitcoin is that unlike EVs, unlike the banking sector, unlike every other industry on the planet, it can form specific off-grid power purchase agreements with off-takers for that energy. So people who are generating energy, they can form direct relationships. That's something the banking sector doesn't and can't do. It's something that no other industry can do. EVs certainly don't do that. They're tethered to the grid. And we know from the data that around 28% of Bitcoin mining companies, at least worldwide, have formed these direct off-grid relationships with power providers. 
Now, who are they providing it with and why are they going off grid? Well, they're going off grid because they can get cheaper power, of course. It's simple economic imperatives. Now, these days, what does cheaper power tend to be? Well, it tends to be renewable, it tends to be sustainable. The cost of generating sustainable, renewable electricity today is significantly cheaper than the equivalent cost of using coal or natural gas in most cases. Not in all, there are some geographic variations, but in most cases. So what that means is these Bitcoin mining companies that are off-grid, 80% of them are using sustainable energy sources. When you add that into the mix, you find that it raises the overall sustainable energy mix of Bitcoin above every other industry sector in the world. So it's now using more than 50% sustainable energy. There is no other global industry in the world that has anywhere close to that. And that's a narrative that hasn't been told. You hear things like Bitcoin uses fossil fuels. Well, of course it does. Every industry uses fossil fuels, including the solar industry. So that's uh, just information that is used out of context in order to create a false narrative. If you're looking at this scientifically, though, and you're doing a comparison, you say what's important is not does it use fossil fuels, but how much is it using? Where is it trending? How does it compare to other industries? And if you look at those statistics, it compares incredibly well. It is the number one user of clean energy as an industry sector in the world right now, and it's trending even more in that direction. That's phenomenal. It is phenomenal. And so what I want to ask you next, it has to do with a, a, a big thesis of yours, which is that once Bitcoin has the ESG checkmark next to it, it unlocks trillions worth of capital that can come in and invest. So that is the setup. And, and we completely agree here. Um, Without getting too much into what it means to have an ESG check mark, let's focus on what you just told us, which is that Bitcoin is actually incredible for the environment, and that is the narrative that we don't have with us. We the, in the mainstream, the narrative is that Bitcoin is bad for the environment, and then proponents of Bitcoin are saying, no, it's actually not bad for the environment but we need to take it three steps further to say it's not that it's not bad, not that it's good, but that it is incredible for the environment. And that because it's incredible for the environment, whatever bureaucratic ESG check mark you have, whatever framework, Bitcoin should have one of the largest checks next to it because of what is happening in this environment. So for the audience, I want to set that up that as Bitcoin, Bitcoin as an investment, yes, there's potential trillions behind an ESG check mark. And we are excited about that potential, but that is not as relevant as the fact that Bitcoin is incredible for the environment. So Daniel, I want you to take Bitcoin is incredible for the environment and give us your best rant here. Explain to the world why it's not just that Bitcoin is not bad, but that it is really something powerful and not just powerful, but so that people understand Daniel has dedicated an enormous portion of his intellectual capacity, career and future to this very concept of Bitcoin mining off of methane capture. So as someone who's actually proof is in the pudding and, and not just talking, but walking, tell us how you feel about this idea that Bitcoin can be so powerful for uh, our, our, our planet and for humanity itself. So the first thing I want to say is some context. So I've seen over 200 different climate tech propositions over the last 10, 15 years. And of those, Bitcoin is by far the most fast acting, measurable and scalable form of climate tech that I've seen. One thing and one advantage that I have coming from a technology investment perspective is that I don't abide by the principle of premature evaluation, which is you look at a technology today and you say, this uses emissions, therefore it's bad. If we had used that as a rubric for evaluating climate tech, we would have banned every single form of climate tech that ever exists. We would have banned wind. We would have banned solar panels. People forget that 
it wasn't until the early 2000s that the solar industry started to pay off its carbon footprint. It's been around since the 1950s. We gave it a 50-year grace period. Environmentalists in the 90s were debating whether it's good for the environment. And you had the premature evaluators who were saying it's using coal, it's bad. But you had the people who had the ability to zoom out and see trajectory who said, wait a minute, it's trending in the right direction and it could be absolutely incredible. Bitcoin has that same potential that I see in the solar industry, unquestionably. And if you look at how it's trending, if you look at its ability to solve very real problems on the grid, such as when you put more intermittent power on the grid, you can only do that in proportion to your capacity to have very flexible consumers. And Bitcoin is the most flexible consumer of energy that has ever existed bar none. It can be scaled up and down within a heartbeat and to a precise calibration. We've never had a flexible user like that. And the grid stabilization capacity is so huge that I can't imagine that any nation in the world will be successful in variable renewable energy-based grids and they don't have very flexible consumers at the same time to handle that intermittency. And there is no one better than Bitcoin mining. That's the grid side. And then you've got this whole other area, which is methane mitigation. What a lot of people don't realize right now is we're not talking about future stuff. This is happening already. We already have, through Crusoe Energy and through a number of the different Bitcoin mining companies who are taking previously flared gas from the oil and gas industry that was, again, contributing emissions because a lot of that flare stack was still going directly into the atmosphere, leaching methane, and they're now taking that and they're putting it into generators, which is lowering emissions and if you combine that, if you add up the impact of that, Bitcoin's already mitigating 6% of the entire emissions of the Bitcoin network. 6%. That's huge. No one is even close to that. No other industry in the planet can mitigate its emissions to that extent without having to buy offsets. So this is very unique. And that's without even really starting on vented sources of methane. If we start using vented sources of methane, we can go 10 times as fast because using vented methane will mitigate 10 times the emissions that using flared gas emissions will. So Bitcoin has the capability to be the first industry in the world which fully offsets emissions completely without having to use some fiat accounting instrument in order to show on a balance sheet that it's done it by buying someone else's credits. It can do it organically, simply through mitigating more emissions than it's creating. And it's not going to stop there. You think that Bitcoin miners are going to say, hey, job done, we're going to stop? No, of course they're not. They're going to say, hey, there's more cheap power, there's more landfills, there's more pollution, there's more wasted energy that we can monetize. Let's continue this alchemy. Let's keep on turning this waste into digital gold. And the more this scales, you'll see in the future, um, and I'm staking my professional reputation on this, that you're going to see a network which is mitigating vastly more emissions than it is creating this decade. And it doesn't take a lot to do that. As I said, 35 landfills, you're emission neutral. 70 landfills, you're now mitigating twice the emissions you're creating. It's a phenomenal potential. And the incredible thing is that if it weren't for Bitcoin mining, we don't have a number of other good options. It's like, what else are we going to do with that landfill gas? What else are we going to do with that methane? Are we going to try and get every single government in the world to agree to mitigate at the same time? Good luck getting one government to agree, let alone a whole lot of warring parties. We're not going to solve it through regulation. We've never solved global issues through regulation. So how are we going to do it? We're going to monetize it. We're going to make it profitable. Well, who else is going to chase that cheap power? Who else is going to be crazy enough to set up a business on landfill? Who else has 80% of the operating budget being electricity that it makes sense for that capex? There is one customer in the world, and that's Bitcoin mining companies. So we should be very grateful we have them because if it weren't for them, we'd have no economic incentive to mitigate vast swathes of methane, which the United Nations is telling us is our number one lever to reduce climate change. So I would look anyone in the eye and say, you tell me why Bitcoin is not the world's greatest ESG asset in the world right now. Absolutely phenomenal. Daniel, if you can help me with my adjectives, Bitcoin is blank for the world. Incredible is just too generic of a word. 
So how would you describe if you can give us a few adjectives from your angle, right? From, from my angle, finance and rates, macroeconomic perspective, there, there are adjectives that I would choose about um, Bitcoin, innovative and, uh, you know, one of a kind. And I, I'm, I'm curious what, how you would describe it when you're describing it to people in your industry. Bitcoin is hope. Bitcoin is alchemy. To steal a phrase from Troy Cross, Bitcoin is a dung beetle. It recycles wasted stuff and turns it into something that's valuable to everyone. And Bitcoin is the world's honey badger. It's something that people just keep on trying to kill it, but it is so resilient that it just keeps on coming back and you don't mess with a honey badger. And every time that someone has tried to write it off for being a Ponzi scheme or a scam or used by terrorists or terrible for the environment, boiling the oceans, the usual suspects, all it serves to do is galvanize the Bitcoin community even stronger, improve our ability to tell the story and make it even better, and increase the conviction levels in every single person who believes in this currency, this asset, this money, this technology. Daniel Batten, we really appreciate your time. Please tell people where they can find you online in your fantastic work. So the best way would be on x slash Twitter at dsbatten.com. If they want to dive deeper into the weeds, they can go to my research side, which is batcoins.com, B-A-T-C-O-I-N-Z.com. And CH4 Capital is where we're running our infrastructure financing fund for people who are doing Bitcoin mining using landfill gas so they can check us out there. Daniel Batten, thank you so much for joining us today at the Bitcoin layer. We appreciate you. Thank you, Nick. Make sure you check out river.com slash TBL for all of your Bitcoin exchange needs. We love River and the way they operate. They use their own multi-signature cold storage solution so that your funds are not held on a third-party custodian's balance sheet. Thanks again for checking out the Bitcoin layer. I'm Nick Batia. We'll catch you next time.